today is another of uh, the special occasions that we have about four times a year. Uh, we now call them Hollander Rounds. Uh, they are clinical problem solving cases. They were renamed for Harry Hollander, who's in the audience, who is our uh, esteemed uh, a clinician educator, infectious disease specialist, and residency director for more than 20 years, and trained a generation of our residents, many students, uh, in lots of things. But one of the prize things that Harry focused on was diagnostic excellence. And these rounds are really designed to uh, illustrate that and, uh, and teach us all uh, some things about clinical medicine and some things about clinical reasoning. So uh, we're thrilled for this Hollander round uh, to uh, have Dr. Monica Fung be our discussant. <clears throat> Monica is Assistant Professor of Medicine, Associate Director of the Immunocompromised Host Infectious Disease Program. Uh, her research focuses on novel diagnostics to improve the diagnosis of infections among transplant patients. Uh, Monica went to Wellesley, went to Harvard Medical School, got an MPH at the Harvard Chan School, uh, did her medicine residency at Beth Israel Deaconess, and we were lucky enough to recruit her for her ID fellowship and to keep her here. So uh, uh, she's been on our faculty for several years and has already distinguished herself as a uh, superb uh, clinician, educator, and program leader, and uh, has agreed to uh, put herself on the hotspot today. So thank you for doing that. So let me uh, quickly, uh, and the discussion will be uh, conducted by Ty Johnson, who's one of our chief residents. Ty is a future pulmonary and critical care uh, physician uh, going to UCLA in sadly four months or so, yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's, uh, we'll start with the ground rules. And so our discussant has not uh, heard about this case and knows nothing about it. Uh, our goal is to learn from the thought process of the master clinician, not necessarily for them to get the case right, uh, they're not magicians, and I think one of the things that they, this demonstrates is you don't have to know everything, although in the, in, in the era of chat GPT, you do know, have to know something. And, and so, uh, but, uh, but really, it's more about the reasoning and the journey, not the outcome. And uh, I will call on you periodically, Monica may as well, uh, when some, uh, your involvement might be helpful. So uh, this is both meant to be instructive and also to be fun. So hopefully it will be. Thank you for doing this. I'm very excited. Mm. All right, let's go ahead and get started. A 72-year-old man uh, with lumbar stenosis and radiculopathy. He'd had a prior spinal fusion and laminectomy. He also had bladder cancer in remission. He had coronary disease and he had primary biliary cholangitis. So this is a typical Parnassus patient. <laughs> Presented with worsening abdominal and back pain. Three months earlier, he had a liver biopsy at which the diagnosis of his primary biliary uh, cholangitis was made in the setting of elevated LFTs, who was started on ursodiol. Two months earlier, he noted new progressive right lower back pain, sharp and constant with radiation to his right upper quadrant. Uh, didn't have any fevers, chills, or neurological changes at that time. Uh, CT of the abdomen and pelvis, LFTs uh, were uh, unremarkable uh, for a renal or a GI cause. One month prior, his pain had worsened. Uh, he went to see a neurosurgeon who ordered an MRI to assess for neurological etiology. And now the MRI is performed and the results prompted urgent admission for further evaluation. His past history is actually, before I go, are there any, any impressions just from what you've heard so far? What, what's spinning through your mind at this point? Right now, I think the um, differential is quite broad, but I see, I'm hearing a man with lots of chronic medical comorbidities with kind of subacute back pain and abdominal pain. And I'm presuming there are some abnormal MRI findings because the prompt admission is right after the MRI was being conducted. Okay, uh, good. So um, his past history, he's got AFib, he's had his bladder cancer, he's status post-surgery and chemo and is in remission. He's got his coronary disease and he's status post-cabbage, he's got COPD, uh, he's got the usual litany of chronic diseases, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and type 2 diabetes, he has lumbar stenosis with this radiculopathy and this primary biliary cholangitis a diagnosis. Surgical history. Uh, he had an L4-5 uh, transforaminal lumbar fusion and an L2-4 to laminectomy, now three or four years ago, complicated by wound dehiscence followed by a full recovery. 
His meds you see there, uh, sort of a mixture of things. I don't know if uh, I'll quickly read them off. Aspirin, natanolol, allopurinol, gabapentin, uh, metformin, nitro, uh, trelegy inhaler, and ursodiol. On physical, a febrile, normal heart rate, blood pressure is fine, respiratory rate is fine, well saturated in room air. And uh, Ty's been nice enough to just Let's put the stuff in red that that uh, that's abnormal. Everything else is fine except the back. He's got his abdomen. He has mild right upper quadrant tenderness uh, to palpation, not distended, no rebound, no organomegaly, uh, and neurologic um, and uh, spine. He's got thoracic spine tenderness to palpation, but uh, alert and oriented, and no focal neurological deficits, no rashes, lesions, or uh, any note of uh, joint issues or other other issues, lungs are clear. Initial uh, labs, uh, you can go to 12.5, white count's normal, sodium 133, LFTs are fine with the exception of mild elevation in ALKFAS. SED rates 71, CRPs 23, HIVs negative, hemoglobin A1C is 6.6. .6. And here we have the MRI of his thoracic spine. And uh, I will tell you what they said about it. Um, and it's all in red. So mm -hmm. as you said, not, not gonna be normal. Abnormal marrow replacement with edema involving T7 to T9 vertebrae and abnormal fluid intensity within T8-9 disc space. Additional T8-9 paraspinous thickening with bilateral paraspinous fluid collections and a one centimeter ventral epidural fluid collection. So let's stop there. And, uh, and there for folks is uh, demonstrated to be the, uh, the lesions, the fluid collections, the edema in the spine. And clearly even I can see clearly abnormal compared to the other, uh, the other vertebrae and the other, uh, uh, the other disc spaces. Okay, so you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. I think particularly we're interested in what appears to be uh, some sort of vertebral uh, infection and uh, probably osteomyelitis. So what are the things that are going through your mind as you hear this and see that image? Yes, thank you. So just for me to summarize the case as I process through this, 72 year old man has multiple medical comorbidities, including history of bladder cancer, spinal history, um, including uh, spinal stenosis. He has a prior history of posterior spinal fusion um, complicated by wound dehiscence. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that as well as his cancer treatment history. Now with um, about two months of progressive back and abdominal pain with MRI findings concerning for vertebral um, osteomyelitis involving the thoracic spine um, with ventral epidural abscess. So that's my summary of the case. The way I think about vertebral osteomyelitis is I break it down into um, how did it get there? And so there are two ways. It's either hematogenous seating or it's by direct extension. Um, and then I think through also the different pathogens that could be involved. And as an ID doctor, I tend to go through um, my common organisms like bacterial pathogens, um, atypical bacterial pathogens, and then fungi, um, and then uh, viral and uh, parasites don't tend to be um, as involved. So among the common bacterial pathogens, we tend to think about staph, strep, those tend to be um, Staph particularly tends to be more acute in nature. You can also have gram negative, um, uh, like E. coli or Enterobacteraceae involved, Pseudomonas, um, particularly in people who inject drugs. Um, among uh, fungi, um, I think about um, you can have Canada also in people who inject drugs that tends to be the most common um, in immunocompromised patients. You can actually have some more atypical fungi or endemic fungi such as coxie we see here, um, uh, a mold such as aspergillus, and then um, uh, we have atypical organisms as well. So uh, depending on epidemiologic risk and exposures, we can think about TB um, as well as brucellosis. Those are some of the common pathogens that I 
think about. Um, in terms of figuring out for this patient, I would love to kind of sort through kind of where this came from by um, getting some additional imaging. The abdominal pain is kind of pointing to me, like, is there some abdominal pathology that may have either put the patient at risk or sometimes we actually see ex direct extension from the abdominal, uh, intra-abdominally um, posterior to the spine. Um, uh, yeah, so those are some of the right. things. Uh, when, when you hear about his past history, what are the, are the things that sort of pop out that might that put him at risk for, for osteo? And, and does that help you narrow the differential in terms of the pathogen? Yeah, um, so his past medical history, the couple of things that stand out to me are his history of spinal manipulation. Like he's had laminectomies, he's had a posterior spinal fusion um, or a spinal fusion that was complicated by a wound dehiscence. So anytime you have hardware in a space, um, you could get an infection there. So we could have hardware infection with associated um, that could have extended and caused um, uh, vertebral um, osteo in different areas. ask you a question about that. Is that because the, the bone and the surrounding tissues are abnormal and therefore if you have hematogenous spread of something, it's more likely to glom on and cause an infection or because there actually might be a bug that's been hiding there for months, years? I mean, yeah, I great question. So I like to say, even without any hardware present, we do see patients with prior like injury to a location like in the spine where they have spinal degenerative disease, that tends to be a place where you get vertebral osteomyelitis. Um, you can also, if you have hardware there, we all get transient factoremias, for example. Um, and if you have hardware there, your blood doesn't penetrate there. And so can't clear out what you're like a small amount of pathogen mm -hmm. that your, you, your immune system would normally be able to get rid of. So lots of different reasons for that. And then of course, if you've had prior surgery, you have an incision. And sometimes if that breaks down, you can have um, direct extension from skin flora that can then go in and see deeper through those, you know, prior tracks that have been opened and potentially cause infection. But is there some statute of limitations? You know, I had the thing a month ago and I had, you know, I had an infection, I had dehiscence and all that. That's a bug that if I come back with new symptoms, that's probably it. Whereas if I had it a year ago, that's just too long. That's not yeah, something Yeah, yes, that's a great, another great question. We do have these definitions of like early onset versus late onset hardware infections. And usually a month is as you alluded to kind of that definition. Early onset tends to be like usually after surgery, direct extension, but you can, you can get like complications depending on how the surgery was conducted and how complicated it was later than that okay. um, as well. And in terms of his risk that, so it sounds like, you, we know his liver is abnormal in some way. You're a little worried about that causing then hematogenous spread. And you mentioned that could also sometimes spread uh, from the abdomen back into the back directly. Yeah. Sometimes if there's actually intra-abdominal pathology, you can actually, like there is an abscess, for example, or a fistula it could actually extend backwards. Um, so we talked about the, spine, the history of his um, spinal surgeries. I'm also interested in his history of bladder cancer, specifically what he was treated with, because um, a lot of patients who have bladder cancer get treated with BCG, and that can actually also cause disseminated infection, which spreads into the bloodstream and a place that it can manifest. Really? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't like bazillions of people get BCG? Yes, it's a very rare complication, but we can act, we, we, I would say not infrequently, it's not super common, but we do see disseminated wow. BCGosis and it can cause uh, a lot of different manifestations. Um, so you've got a name, BCGosis. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one last thing, I keep thinking things. Mm -hmm. That MRI appearance, is there, do you take anything out of the MRI appearance in terms of telling you anything about hematogenous or not, or what bug it is, uh, you know, are there typical appearances for certain things that, that give you some information? Yeah, there are certainly things that like, um, for example, the way that TB looks, there can be things that like point you towards specific organisms versus not, but I don't think I would rule anything out at this point. Okay. Um, All right. Any questions from anybody or, or comments people want to make? We've got a lot of ID experts in the audience too. Any other comments folks want to make? Uh, we'll go on. All right, admitted to an outside hospital and underwent IR guided abscess drainage. Is that the right thing to do at this point? Stick a needle in there? Yeah, when we have an abscess, we 
do think it's reasonable. I would have to look at the look, look with neuroradiology at the location of the ventral epidural abscess. We don't tend to go first with um, image guided drainage here because we have such a strong neurosurgery presence. We tend to ask them to weigh in um, and see if they can actually go in and intervene from a surgical standpoint more often, but that seems reasonable. So the tension here is you just go and get fluid or do you actually go in there and clean out bone if it looks like it's infected? Whenever there's an epidural abscess, um, we always favor source control. And so the when this, our surgeons go in, it is off, it's both for source control as well as diagnostic to give us all the samples. And, um, and can I assume that it's a cardinal sin to start antibiotics before you do any of this stuff? Great question. So this is something that we think it, like we often teach our fellows. Um, for simple vertebral osteomyelitis, we um, we often will say hold antibiotics until sampling is done. The big exclusion for that is epidural abscess, um, because epidural abscess, if uh, if it expands, can cause significant neurologic compromise. So I'd be interested in looking at the MR with our neuroradiologists. Like, is there already impingement on the nerve, et cetera, how the patient's neurosymptoms. So guide me for the next time I'm on okay. service, 10 o'clock at night, new diagnosis of epidural abscess. And by the time neurosurgery is going to be able to go and do their thing or IR, it's going to be seven or eight in the morning. Patient does or does not have neuro symptoms. Let's say patient has no signs of neurological compromise. Do you hold the antibiotics then, or and and then uh, if the patient does have neurological compromise, it sounds like you would argue you should start the antibiotic. If right. neurologic compromise, definitely start antibiotics. Even without neurologic compromise, we would say generally it is okay to start antibiotics. There's obviously if everything is a spectrum. So if it's just like a tiny bit of that epidural enhancement, like maybe when the ID mm -hmm. team saw the thing, we wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. do it. But I think if there's any concern about epidural abscess, it's completely reasonable to start antibiotics. And and that doesn't screw things up when you finally it get a may... sample. And now we have a patient on broad spectrum antibiotics for the next hundred years. That's not a problem. Yes. As ID doctors, we love our diagnostics yes. and we <laughs> always want to make the diagnosis, but not at the um, the expense of like the patient's care, right? So absolutely we will, um, the patient's care come first. We don't want, we want to prevent any neurologic compromise. So okay. epidural abscess, start antibiotics. Good to know. Okay. All of our ID people agree with that. Everybody is, is that non-controversial in ID world with no, with no <laughs> neurological <laughs> symptoms, but just an evidence of evidence of epidural abscess and fluid collection. How are you, do you are, are you on well, that page? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I mean, one thing apart from the antibiotics is this person, anybody admitted should be in a relatively monitored setting, you know, because classically epidural abscess symptomatology starts with so-called spinal ache, also known as back pain, and <laughs> progresses to ridiculous symptoms as you get nerve root involvement. And, and then classically, you, you begin to see the problems with the long track, uh, with the long track signs. So antibiotics aside to monitor setting is- Monitor setting, setting, you mean like neuro exams exactly every few hours? Neuro, fre frequent neurologic yeah. checks by someone who can do that. Actually knows how to do it. Yeah. Yes, like nurses, for example. Um, <laughs> Um, and the other thing is systemic illness, which, which Monica didn't, didn't touch upon. I mean, if somebody is, you know, has SIRS, <clears throat> apart yeah. from whatever they have locally and neurologic findings, you know, then would have, one would have a very low threshold to, uh, to start. And so does that influence you at all here? The fact that no fever, no white count kind of doesn't look toxic. Does that change your thinking about this at all? I think that plus the subacute nature of what's going on makes me think... I still am worried about our typical bacterial pathogens, but I think it brings it down maybe a little bit and all the other kind of more atypical hmm. and things that cause more chronic infections are also up there. Interesting. So it did help. It not only you, it thinks you think about the pace, but also it actually influences you're thinking about what pathogen yeah. by virtue of them not looking that sick. Okay. Uh, pick his place patient was started empirically on IV Vanco and Cefepime, and they withheld the antibiotics prior to the IR procedure. So, all right. It all depends on when the procedure is going to be in the yeah. as Harry Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. got it. What do, what do you think that empiric choice of antibiotics? Okay, I think that's reasonable, right? Like the things that you want to definitely that can progress super rapidly and cause people to get really ill are going to be your typical bacterial. So we usually bank ceftriaxone, cefepime if there's risk factors for pseudomonas. Yeah. Uh, and he was discharged with close follow up. Is that okay, or this is someone who needs to be in the hospital and 
monitored for some period of time. Um, was the plan to empirically treat the patient for until the cultures came, came back. back and then hopefully narrow? Yeah, I think it depends on if I, I would love to have had a surgeon take a look at the case. Oftentimes, um, they, if the surgeon declines doing inter in any intervention or we're planning on medical management and the patient is stable, then these are situations that we would discharge the patient yeah. on IV antibiotics. <laughs> And once, let's assume they drained the epidural abscess, is he safe now from the standpoint of, and he's not gonna get his Q2 hour neuro exams at home. So is he safe from the standpoint of neurological compromise? If if, uh, if you think the IR says we we got all the fluid? She does, he, I think the patient would be safer than if it were not drained. I, what we do in these situations, our backup plan is the catchment is get very short interval imaging to make sure that the it hasn't reaccumulated. Got it, okay. <laughs> Uh, so after discharge, uh, the cultures of the drainage were negative. Continued IV vanco and cefepime through home infusion. Uh, switched to receiving antibiotics in infusion center during to, uh, due to insurance issues. Uh, got six weeks of treatment empirically, I guess, with both of those antibiotics, and the back pain continued to worsen. MRI was repeated. What do you think of? Uh, should they have waited six weeks? Should they have gotten a another scan sooner if he's not getting better in terms of the pain? That is a great question. Um, so I think the framework is for most cases of vertebral osteomyelitis, where you have a confirmed diagnosis and you're treating we act without any um, soft tissue extension, like epidural abscess or psoas abscess, we actually don't image at the end of therapy because bony changes are expected to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, with soft tissue and particularly without adequate source control, I definitely would re-image. Um, and uh, when you re-image, I think kind of depends on how worried you are about the patient. Um, Assuming he hadn't developed a fever, didn't wasn't toxic, just continued to have progressive back pain. I think four or six weeks is reasonable. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And so now... Uh, how would you approach, so would you, is this now under the category of culture negative uh, uh, osteomyelitis and or epidural abscess? Yes, um, because the cultures were drawn prior to um, getting, uh, sorry, um, the sampling was done prior to antibiotics. So right. I would put this patient safely into the culture negative osteomyelitis okay. category. How do you now think about that? Um, yeah, so I think this takes the, differential that I had before, and I think pushes it more towards some of the less typical pathogens. And so first thing I would actually want to confirm is whether or not the patient actually got some antibiotics prior to that hospital admission, because we often in ID will say the most common cause of culture negative stuff is having preceding antibiotics. Mm -hmm. If that's not the case, then we're thinking towards some more of the atypical pathogens that we talked about. Um, harder to grow organisms, um, uh, fungi, atypical bacteria. And so what do you do? Do you broaden, do you start covering all that? Cover stuff? all the things. Have every, have, <laughs> do you go back and get more, more tissue? What do you, what do you do? Um, additional diagnostics is definitely the way that I would approach this because the, now the differential for these atypical things are so broad and the treatments are so different and often interact with each other. Um, definitely getting more diagnostics. Stop, mm -hmm. stop the antibiotics. Um, I would have to look at the imaging to see these case can sometimes be really nuanced because um, what do they mean by not getting better? Was it just some like partial response? Mm -hmm. Everything got worse. Mm -hmm. I'd like to look at the imaging to stop. Okay, let's look at the imaging. Uh, I think it was worse. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> That's a repeat uh, T-spine, T8, nine osteo and discitis noted with interval progression increasing destruction of the inferior T8 end plate and compression of the thecal sac and cord, enhancing paraspinous soft tissue, compatible with phlegmon with peripherally enhancing fluid collection in the right paraspinous space. That sounds worse. Definitely yeah. sounds worse. All right, so <laughs> how does that influence, does that change? Obviously you already, you already told us, I'm less concerned about bacteria, more concerned about atypicals. Any atypicals that are more likely to do that? It's clear this thing has been marching along. Yeah, I, I think it's hard for me to clearly differentiate among some of the more atypical causes, um, but I would definitely get more diagnostics. <laughs> okay, so, and what is that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think it depends on the setting, right? Um, and this pr progression looks bad enough that the patient needs some sort of intervention to actually stabilize their spine, right? There is compression of the fecal sac and so the now cord. This is neurosurgical. This is now yeah, a neurosurgical is issue, yeah. and therefore the sampling should be done intraoperatively when they go in. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to wait for a period of time for the antibiotics to get out of the system? Or at this point, you're really not at all concerned about bacteria. You really are completely looking for atypicals. I mean, there's certainly reasons why this could be a typical bacterial process, right? They, the, the, the patient got an IR drainage of the abscess, which probably helped, but wasn't the optimal source control. So I cannot completely rule out typical bacteria from um, my differential. Uh, but yeah, I would go, this is, this is a neurosurgical issue that requires intervention immediately. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is having now seen that radiograph, are you stopping the antibiotics? Um, I would hope that the surgeons are going in soon. soon and so sure. I feel like it's kind of, it, it can be somewhat of a moot point. The antibiotics are already on board. And so right. sometimes we will just say, continue what the patient is currently on, um, get a bunch of samples, including molecular diagnostics, because those can be positive um, even when patients have been on antibiotics because it's not relying on culture growth. So explain um, to we lay people what molecular yeah, means. so most of our existing microbiology, traditional microbiology requires us getting samples and they take it to the micro lab and they put it in bacteria food or fungus food and expect the organism to grow. Of course, if you've been giving antibiotics, those, uh, they might be killing some of the bacteria or make it hard to grow. And so your culture's traditional um, uh, micro methods relying on growth can be negative. Molecular diagnostics are looking for the nucleic acid of the organism. So common things that we send here are um, universal PCR, which is sent over to University of Washington, where they do like, they have select primers for 16S, like the ribosomal um, uh, uh, regions of bacteria or ITS regions of fungi, and they will sequence it and try to amplify. Um, yeah, so that's what we tend to do. On tissue. And that's looking, is that looking for everything or just fungi or TB or what is it going to find Great. or what is it not going to find? Yeah, so there are different, I think what you're alluding to is there are different types of molecular diagnostics that are um, unbiased versus biased. And biased means that you actually have to select what they test for. And so at the um, for universal PCR, we, we ask them to, we usually select bacteria, fungal, and um, mycobacterial, um, and then they have also very specific ones looking, for example, at like aspergillus or TB that we could also request. Why would you just not want unbiased? Why, why wouldn't you want to search for everything? Um, so unbiased is not an option for the, the amplified sequencing types, but um, if you are very, very suspicious for one specific organism, actually selecting to just amplify for that organism is more sensitive than doing like a uh, less like like trying to amplify all of like for all fungi for example Got it. Mm. and why not have done that with the first aspiration it's just you're you're secure enough that you're going to get a positive culture you, we just don't generally yeah, that's a great do question. that on the first try we i think if the patient were here we probably would have asked for a first, sample uh, to be try. saved for that testing but it is a very specific um or more specialized test and so often centers that aren't um a tertiary or quaternary centers may not have access to it mm -hmm. I'm guessing these things don't come back tomorrow and nor do the cultures and other things for fungus and TB and other things. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So are you starting the patient on anything? Um, I think the most important thing right now is the patient's spine gets Yeah. Stabilized. So let's assume he's gonna, the neurosurgeon's yeah, yeah. going to come by. They're going to do all the stuff they need to do and they'll send it off for all that good stuff. But it's probably not going to come back with an answer tomorrow. I mean, we will not have a final answer tomorrow. Um, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. I would necessarily broaden, but I would. I would get preliminary pathology and all that stuff within the next like 24, 48 hours mm -hmm. to make that decision. Okay. Because as I mentioned, it is the process is the differential is so broad. Like, would you do antifungals? Would you do t like anti-tuberculosis? That's, that's why I'm asking therapy, you. Right? I'm for sure. Idea, so. And so um, we still ha haven't heard a ton about this patient's epidemiology, which actually, which would actually impact what I choose for empiric therapy. So if the patient's, you know, again, the BC, whether or not the patient's had BCG therapy, if they've had a history of latent tuberculosis, all of these things would factor into my decision about empiric therapy. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, oh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. One other consideration for ultra negative osteomyelitis epidural abscess is that 
<clears throat> it's culture negative because it's not, not an infection. infection. Not infection. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would, you know, <laughs> remind ourselves that this man has a history of bladder cancer. Totally. Some the radiologist can be helpful, you know, with some aspects of the imaging, like what parts of the vertebral mm -hmm. body are involved. Sometimes that's helpful, but metastases sometimes show up, infiltrative diseases of the bone sometimes show up, plasma cytomas, multiple myeloma may have, you know, contiguous fluid collections with with vertebral involvement, so that's a great point. Yeah, excellent point. <laughs> okay, uh, he he's sent here for further evaluation. We get some additional data, family history, sister, of course, with a prior history of valley fever. Social history: forty pack years smoking, occasional alcohol, never any substance use. Uh, U.S. born, has lived in rural Central Valley for many decades. Recently retired, worked as a dairy farmer, of course. Uh, no sick contacts, no history of international travel, incarceration, or housing insecurity. I don't think we have a, a pet history, but and actually kind of fun that he came to UCSF and our contribution was doing a better history. That's kind of nice. Um, all right, what do you make of all this? Yeah, so as alluded to, the epidemiology and um, uh, social history makes a huge difference. So being from the Central Valley, um, having a sister with prior coxy infection, obviously, brings valley fever or coxie up on the differential. Being a dairy farmer brings up um, processes such as uh, brucellosis or um, it's not super common here, but people can actually get like mycobacterium bovis from cows more in um, if they've been in Mexico. So those are some of the things that are brought up with my differential. Okay, so they, they, they brought up your differential, but there's nothing there that's going to cause you to say, we need to start something for Coxie today. Yeah, I mean, I actually, um, based on this history, might start an empiric antifungal on the patient, especially given that it progressed um, to the point that they need, like pretty over the course of a month mm -hmm. to needing like uh, spinal surgery. And mm -hmm. so the options would be very targeted towards um, valley fever or coxie with high dose fluconazole. Or if the patient's um, renal function is normal, um, you could consider doing ambosome, which would be much broader and for severe cases of valley fever, but obviously is a very broad antifungal and could cover other organisms. And okay well. to have coxie and this much spinal disease and lungs are just fine? Yeah, great question. So this would be, if this were um, uh, dis coxy, it would be disseminated coxy. And the pathophysiology of disseminated coxy is actually... Um, Usually primary infection is pulmonary, they breathe it in, and it's early on in the setting of getting that infection that there is some hemato hematogenous dissemination to different sites. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get seeding of the bone and it takes a long time to manifest or of the brain and it can take months or even years for it to truly manifest clinically. You can also definitely have widely disseminated coxy infection. Um, that, at least here at Parnassus, we see more in our very immunocompromised um, patients. And those patients are very, very ill. They're febrile, you know, in the ICU hypoxemic respiratory failure. Mm -hmm. um, but in thinking about this broad differential, um, we talked about imaging before, this would actually be a point that I would do additional imaging to just get a sense of what other sites are potentially involved. And that can also help with the differential and potentially additional sites to target for diagnostics. Makes sense. Okay, so you did went through that and uh, actually did the diagnostic tests already. And interesting that, and when, when the sister having it cues you in and maybe crosses your threshold to start antifungals, is it that he would have gotten it from her or that he might have had the same risk factors that she did in their I think it's more exposed? that she might have, um, that that uh, he might have had the same risk factors. He obviously is in an endemic region, but maybe I don't, like as a farmer, like maybe they're in, maybe they're, they're working in the same area area where their soil has to have, tends to have a high burden of the organism. Got it. Okay, some more data. Uh, you guys said we should get a bunch of tests. So yes. I got a bunch of tests. Uh, blood cultures negative, brucella uh, uh, less than one to 20, coxie less than one to two, coxie antibody, uh, one was uh, complement fixation, then ID negative, uh, coxie Bernetti negative, histo negative, histoplasma antibody less than one to eight. Anything here that we should understand? They're all, they're all negative, but I'm happy you to talk through them. One thing I hope, just, just, one yeah, thing yeah. I potentially would add, um, given that Coxy is relatively high on our differential, is a Coxy um, antigen. And then, um, as we're talking about um, 
molecular diagnostics, I would probably also send a plasma metagenomic next generation sequencing test um, as well. Okay, mm -hmm. but the, these these COX tests do they rule out this being COX? Um, it makes it lower on the differential. You would think that one of them would be positive. Okay. Um, Said rate and CRP still high. CT chest, a little tiny uh, nodule, no other abnormalities. CT abdomen pelvis, renal cyst, no other abnormalities. They were looking around, I guess, probably for the same reason you wanted to. Does that help you? Help you? Um, yeah, it's uh, helpful in the sense that there isn't other sites that are clearly, like if there, there was a like miliary pattern in the lungs, that would be like helpful. And you said coxy less likely based on these, if you had decided to start your antifungal, would you be stopping them now? I would wait for, if I made a, I try to be thoughtful about starting and stopping my antimicrobials. So if I had already empirically started, um, I would wait for more like tissue-based diagnostics to come back before stopping. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we talked that through already. So more stuff here. Uh, as you recommended, we call the neurosurgeons mm -hmm. T8, T9, vertebral resection, T6 to 11, posterior spinal fusion. So pretty big surgery. T8, 9 bone found to be necrotic with gross purulence in the disc space. T8, 9 vertebral bodies and discs sent for bacterial fungal, mycobacterial culture and pathology and UPCR. That's the right test? Yep, those are the tests. All mm -hmm. right. Good. Patient restarted empirically on vanco and cefepime. Yes? No? Why Why start antibiotics? Yeah, I, I feel like some people often are like, well, it didn't work. Why are you doing this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like one of those people. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say that is, uh, I, I, my inclination was like, if the patient were already on vanco and cefepime, reasonable to continue. I think the gross purulence that tends to make us worried about a typical bacterial process and given the severity of the illness, um, the, of course, always kind of patient-centered approach, we want to prevent further de uh, um, uh, further decompensation, starting vanco, cefepime, very, very reasonable. Are you thinking that, that this still could have been it all along or that maybe the thing's now super infected? Um, I'm thinking that it maybe could have been it all along. Cause we talked about like, initially they did get aspirate, uh, right, right. An IR guided aspiration. That is not ideal source control. So right. there is still the possibility right. that like, this is a source control Just, issue. I mean, not knowing anything about it, it strikes me a little bit negative culture <clears throat> and got that much worse on six weeks of those antibiotics. Yes. It, it is less likely, but I think severity of illness makes it so that I think- We just don't want to be wrong. We just don't want to be wrong, yeah. exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll buy that. Post-discharge, so he has his neurosurgery uh, and he's back on his antibiotics. His operative cultures remain negative. Patients discharged to rehab with plan to continue IV antibiotics. One week later, surgical pathology returns. You seem excited. You think this is going to give you the answer? Um, maybe, we'll see. All right. Non-specific. Grant. Section so granular. Frag I was going to say. All right. <laughs> frag fragments of fibroconnective tissue with a dense, predominantly chronic inflammatory infiltrate, necrotic debris, occasional multinucleated giant cells, and numerous granulomas. No definite organism seen. All right. How does that change your thinking? Yeah. Um, as, as you can tell by my reaction, this is a situation that we have run into before. So this points me in the direction of like a granulomatous infection. Infections that commonly cause granulomas are mycobacterial infections, um, TB, um, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, as well as fungal pathogens. Um, so it sounds like fungal and TB and non-tuberculous non uh, mycobacteria were sort of on, that was top of your list anyway. Does this narrow that from that list? Um, the patient didn't have significant TB risk factors. So I think that might bring like TB itself lower on my differential. Um, we still haven't heard anything about the patient's bladder cancer treatment history. So I'm wondering about BCG still. What was the thing you called it? BCG? Itis? Osis. <laughs> BCG osis. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So uh, any, what are you going to do now? You're just going to still wait for pathology, uh, wait for cultures and the molecular tests, or is this enough for you to start something? And if so, what's the something? Yeah, that's a great question. I would call our micro lab and be like, when are the other results going to be? A week. A week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would also see how the patient is doing. Um, 
Um, Sounds like patient semi-stable, outpatient still. Yeah. But so you, you you feel like your hand is forced to start something with this? I would probably the for me an easier thing to start potentially would be an antifungal and the reason i'm saying that is because treatments for mycobacterial infections tend to be um uh, have a lot of interactions and there are multiple multiple drugs and um, without knowing exactly which mycobacteria you're treating like an empiric regimen might include something even like five drugs or something like that <laughs> okay um so uh uh, I think this is at, at a point where we're 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 asking you for uh, what you think the diagnosis turned out to be. Um, if I had to make a final diagnosis, you don't have to, but that's you're here. So. Yeah, I think we we already it's talked part of the ritual. B, <laughs> um, maybe disseminated BCG. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I can't say I've ever heard of that. So. Mm. So, but you guys have seen it? Yes, we have seen it. Mm. Okay. So AFB smear is performed on the biopsy and is negative, but the spinal AFB cultures return positive for AFB growth. <coughs> MTB PCR is positive for MTB complex. Culture susceptibilities show resistance only to pyrazinamide. On review of the case, no significant additional TB risk factors are present. A final diagnostic test return. Sounds like, well, any other things that you want to know? <laughs> other than the final diagnostic test, <laughs> I want to know whether or not the patient got BCG for his bladder cancer treatment. Wow. So the fi final diagnostic test is, is like more history. <laughs> oh, old school. Um, Mycobacterium bovis, BCG vertebral osteolitis. They gave, got more history and found out he'd gotten intravesicular BCG for his bladder cancer, confirmed on review of the oncology record. So I'm going to stop and pause. <laughs> so I think, Ty, you're going to come up and teach us a little bit about this? There you go. Is that right? Where this one? Awesome job, Monica. Thank you, Bob. Um, so some teaching points from this case. So starting with uh, what is Mycobacterium bovis? So it, uh, M. bovis is part of the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, um, which is a family of organisms that are known to cause tuberculosis disease in humans and or animals, and is uh, distinctly separate from non-tuberculous mycobacteria, mycobacterium lefrae, which we kind of treat as kind of distinct um, organisms. Um, M. bovis is the main cause of tuberculosis in mammals such as cattle and deer. And in humans, it accounts for only less than 2% of infectious tuberculosis cases, but when it does cause clinical disease, its manifestations are pretty much similar to that of M, tuberculosis. The diagnosis in this case centered on the administration of Bacillus calmet geron or BCG. Um, BCG is a live attenuated strain of Mycobacterium bovis. Most people will recognize BCG as um, for its widespread use in uh, TB vaccination. And uh, it was developed in 1920 in over 100 years later it remains the only vaccine for general use against mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, in the setting has an overall protective efficacy of about 20 to 30 percent, which makes it fairly worthwhile to use in uh, areas with a medium to high uh, risk of TB disease and TB burden. Um, in the U.S., where we have a relatively low TB burden, uh, we generally don't recommend the administration of BCG and rely more on more effective epidemiologic control measures, such as the routine uh, screening, diagnosis, and treatment of latent tuberculosis, for example. Um, BCG... Um, it's relatively safe. It causes most commonly local uh, self-limited skin reactions. Um, in, in one to two percent of cases, it can cause infectious localized complications, including abscess and lymphadenitis. lymphadenitis. Um, disseminated BC, BCG infection from vaccination alone is exceedingly rare, less than about one in a million in immunocompromised <laughs> patients, um, but can be more common in immunocompromised hosts. The second most common use of BCG that may be more unknown to, to many people is that it's actually first line adjuvant intravescal therapy for superficial non-muscle invasive bladder cancer status post resection. The exact uh, mechanism of action is still under investigation, but we do know that BCG in this setting triggers, triggers lo local immune response by recruiting cells such as CD4 cells and macrophages to the site of cancer. Also, um, increases cytokine production and has been shown to directly suppress tumor growth. 
Um, trials have shown that it has superior efficacy versus traditional intravesical chemotherapy with one study showing that patients given intravesical BCG had a 68% complete response in relatively high risk carcinoma in situ versus 50 to 51% complete response just using intravesical chemotherapy. So there's significant demonstrated efficacy and that's why it's first line. With this, you may wonder, does BCG have um, applications in other cancers or autoimmune disorders? It has been studied in other processes such as prostate cancer, melanoma, and multiple sclerosis um, with varying degrees of efficacy and at this point remains largely um, non-traditional investigational for uses in these settings. Um, this patient had a complication of BCG, uh, intravesical therapy. About one to four patients who receive intravesical BCG do develop an infectious complication. This likely occurs via uroepithelial disruption at the time of administration. Manifestations can range from local complications such as cystitis to more systemic diseases such as spondylolisthesis, um, as in this case, arthritis and hepatitis. It remains relatively rare with only 118 distinct BCG cases reported in the U.S. between 2004 and 2015 in one study. There are some definitive identified risk factors for BCG, um, disseminated BCG, BCG and BCG infection, including traumatic catheterization uh, for patients with urothelial cancer, active cystitis at the time of administration, immunocompromised host, and age greater than or equal to 70. And it does have a considerable mortality rate of about 5% and 7% risk of long-term complication. The treatment um, for BCG infectious complications are, as in this case, um, relatively uniformly with long-term TB, anti-TB therapy. And our final learning point for this case, we'll kind of go back to Monica's great differential for granulomatous vertebral osteomyelitis. There was one recent uh, paper in, uh, in orthopedics that showed four, kind of homing in on four major bacterial causes, one being MTB and MTP complex organisms, Brucella, actinomyces, and nocardia, and some more rarer case reportable organisms that show up occasionally are things like Coxiella, Coxioides, Blastomyces, Aspergillus, Cryptococcus, and Canada, many of which Monica also mentioned. Um, and these tend to be more prevalent in immunocompromised hosts. With that, Bob, I'll great. Thing well, back to you. Can you come back up, Monica? Thanks, Todd. That was great. So uh, in a few minutes, I'd love to hear your reflections, what, what you think that the learning points are from this. And how the experience was going through it. Sounds like, I think this is the first one you've done for a general medicine audience. Yeah, so. um, it, it was great. I think it's it's awesome to, how, going through like systematically how you would think through a case and having a broad differential and narrowing down and making clinical decisions. Um, I think, uh, I will say this is a case that we, it is infrequent, but not completely uncommon and in infectious diseases. And I think a lot of our, in fact, oh, we have amazing ID clinicians here who I think all would have reached the same conclusion. Um, I, I fibbed slightly when I said I'd never heard of it because I had heard of it as of yesterday I was on the slides, <laughs> but I had, not, I had not heard of it before then. Yeah. So actually, let me quickly do the summary and then Harry, and we'll, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear any questions or comments. So so the patient was diagnosed with uh, with MTB or M mycobacterial, not MTB, vertebral osteomyelitis, which is a form of POTS disease from M bovis infection and complication from the BCG. Started on uh, INH ethambutol rifampin for a nine month treatment course and postoperatively uh, he's apparently doing, doing well. Great. Yeah. And that, any comments about the therapy? And length of therapy for this? Yeah, the um, there's the, the classic, uh, even without uh, knowing that it was pyrazinamide resistance, if you know it's embovis, that is the classic way that the susceptibilities um, for mycobacterium bovis shows up. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just going to do that a little bit and just want to thank uh, Ty and also Madison Malone, who are two chief residents who put this and all of these cases together, which takes a tremendous amount of work. So thank you. Uh, we have time for questions and comments. And Harry, can Lakshmi, people can hear when just uh, through, the, through the mics. So one thing that struck an off note right in the initial presentation was a 70-ish year old man getting this diagnosis of primary biliary cholangitis or cirrhosis. But this is not the right epidemiology for that for that diagnosis. You know, it's a diagnosis of people in their 30s, 40s. 50s, maybe more female predominant, uh, and especially after Ty's uh, recap of clinical manifestations of disseminated BCG, one wonders 
was that really a diagnosis or was that a manifestation of disseminated mycobacterial disease uh, as well? It would be interesting to go back to the pathology. PBC often coexists with sarcoidosis, um, you know, assuming that the granulomata in the liver are non-caseating uh, granulomata, but it would be it would be interesting to know more about the, the liver pathology. Wow, that's an interesting point. Any comments? Yeah, absolutely. When we see disseminated mycobacterial disease, it often presents as a cholestatic liver pattern. So I think um, that is what Harry was alluding to. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, so about 90 people tuning in online. One question is, you know, could the need for spinal stabilization have been avoided? Like, could this diagnosis have been made earlier before the deterioration? Or is this one of those just very hard diagnoses? And the second question is, can genetic sequencing differentiate cattle-born M. bovis from PCG? Um, Great question. So I think that brings us back to the initial diagnostics. Um, it sounds like standard culture recent. The yield off of these cult uh, the, these samplings um, often isn't very high, but it does make me wonder if we did a molecular diagno diagnostic, would, would we have found that? Because um, uh, it is very difficult to grow mycobacteria. And so we often rely on molecular diagnostics. So let me just ask that in a maybe sharper way. So if in this case, they do the aspiration, they send it off for culture, they start the antibiotics in retrospect, it's purely the retrospectoscope. Should they then a week later when the cultures come back negative, send the molecular, save some fluid, I don't know if it still lasts that long, but um, sent it off for molecular tests and pursued that? Or was it sort of a reasonable thing given the prevalence of bacteria to just go ahead and treat for the course and assume he's probably gonna get better? I think based on his subacute history, I would have automatically have sent, uh, saved a specimen. And what our micro labs do, does is they just freeze it and they mm -hmm. won't send it off until um, we the cultures are not growing. And then they will go and ahead. You, and you would have done that a week. The cultures come back fully negative. At that point, you would have sent it off. Yeah, if it houses. hadn't been growing for about a month. Um, and I also don't know if they sent like fungal or mycobacterial cultures. Typically, mm -hmm. we would have asked for, especially in this type of case with the subacute presentation, would have asked for bacterial, fungal, AFB cultures, as well as um, safe specimen for molecular testing. Okay, so there is some possibility that if that was done, we would have figured this out earlier and then perhaps saved some of this. Yeah. It's fine. I think that's a good lesson from the case. What was the other the other question? About yeah. differentiating. differentiating from I don't know the answer to that question. I would think genetically they're pretty much the same, but I don't do any of my ID Anybody colleagues know? know that answer. Harry no, Sarah no. There, BCG that's used medically, there's like very few strains that are used commonly. It's like a couple yeah. of suppliers. Mm -hmm. So presumably you'd be able to identify strains from those suppliers. Um, I've looked into this in the context of looking at susceptibility testing and questioning whether you need three drugs or if you can go down to two automatically once you know the diagnosis. And I think it, the medically used ones are pretty reliably susceptible to INH. And Todd, do you know if the, the, the BCG that's used for the bladder is the same? Is it the same formulation that you use for the vaccine? I, I think so. There are different Different countries, I think, have different, slightly different formulations. So I would have to look more into that. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was going to mention that, um, as Monica mentioned earlier, cattle derived BCPR M. bovis is like very rare. I think from way back when, when I attended a TV conference, there was like a, a lot of uh, interest in this case in Nebraska. And when there is embovis diagnosed as like TB, they do, if there's like the rice risk, risk factors, they will investigate into the cattle to see if it matches. And in this case, they did match it through sequencing. So I think it's probably more rare to encounter that situation versus, you know, the more utilized ECG treatment for, for bladder cancer. And Luis, can they tell the difference by sequencing between the cattle derived? I guess I, I know from what's, um, Sarah, it's very few strains, but I don't know if like, those are also strains that are found in cattle. And so could you exclude, for example? Yeah, yeah, that, mm -hmm. yeah that I wouldn't be able to share, I guess, by comparing your mm -hmm. genetic data. Yeah. Do you usually see the M. bovis from BCG uh, usually just going to tissue planes that have been disrupted already, like in this patient who had surgery, or will it 
or does it seed also tissue intact areas that are Great question. I think disseminated BCG can occur lots of, there can be different manifestations. A lymphadenitis is a very common presentation. Those lymph nodes tend to be, you know, normal. Um, and you can certainly have it see just like normal spine as well. And is it in the distribution of the shot? I mean, lymphadenitis in the femoral region or where it, or it can go? Anywhere. No, it can it's go anywhere. It's hematogenous. Yeah, it's hematogenous. It's Got it. Kind of naive question, but would this suggest like if a patient has bladder cancer and they're being treated BCG, we should like monitor them over the years to see if they might develop something that is fine? That's a really great question. Um, unfortunately, there aren't really great ways to monitor for d TB in general outside of like clinical monitoring. And so of course, like the patient should be following up with their oncologist. And I think it just should be on the differential for um, any clinical signs and symptoms that could be uh, manifestations of disseminated BCG. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, particularly with all of the oncology drugs to like go through all the treatments, but it, I'm sure in most cases, this would just be you got chemo. Yeah. And then really in a case like this going and peeling that back and saying, what did he actually get is really important. Any other, uh, actually anything else online? The only other one is you kind of alluded to it, but any other risk factors that this patient might've had for getting this rare complication? Um, I think Ty gave a nice um, outline of the risk factors. It's hard to know without knowing how the patient was at the moment, like when he was receiving the BCG, like whether he had cystitis. It doesn't seem like he was other, um, otherwise like immunocompromised. I don't know if he also got other therapies that may have been immunocompromising around the time um, that he was getting BCG that might have caused him to be at higher risk for disrupting his mucosal barrier. Great. Any last questions? Terrific. Monica, thank you so much.